Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm just going to have a quick note about computing the inverse of a matrix uh, because I, for a change, uh, had some foresight and decided to build uh, in, into my row red function the capability for handling um, matrices B that are uh, larger than column vectors. So uh, B can be actually any size matrix as long as the number of rows in B matches the number of rows in A. And you can plug in any any B. Um, that actually will allow us to to also calculate the um, I, uh, sorry the inverse of a matrix using the same function. Recall that the row red uh, function solves the equation a x equals b, where a and b are given matrices and x is the solution. So all we have to do is take b equal to the identity matrix. Now there's one slight quirk in Math MATLAB, uh, not a big deal, but just that, uh, well, no computer language really wants to use <clears throat> i, a single letter, to denote a function, right, an important function like the uh, identity matrix. So what they do in MATLAB is they call it i, e-y-e. -E. Uh, well, it works, and I think other ma uh, languages have copied that, um, that trick. Uh, so to the, the function that returns the n by n identity matrix is called EYE i of n and therefore if you want to calculate the inverse of a matrix you can is uh, issue the command row red uh, a comma i of n uh, assuming I, uh, a is an n by n matrix and this will return the inverse of course if the inverse doesn't exist which can happen then um, this will return an error I probably should have put some uh, error code in my function, right, to, to check whether um, uh, the, the, if, if the matrix turned out to be non-invertible or, or the uh, solution turned out to be non-solvable, that you, it would detect that and, uh, and not just crash. But actually, I think it will just crash with, with, with an error, probably division by zero, I would think, if the uh, inverse doesn't exist, right? It will throw the error division by zero. Okay. Now, the main topic for today, and it's not a long one, this is not going to take long, uh, I want to talk about the computational complexity of Gaussian elimination. Um, so let's suppose that we're going to solve um, a system AX equals B, where A is an n by n matrix, and B, we'll make the simplifying assumption, B is just an n by 1 matrix. So uh, just assume that B is just a vector in this case. Then um, I'm going to let capital N of little n uh, stand for the number of multiplications and divisions that are required in order to do the calculation, right, to solve for x. Um, okay, and um, this is kind of a, a uh, an interesting example of uh, uh, you know operation counting. We're going to count the number of multiplications and uh, divisions that we do. In the book, they do a more thorough job. They also count the number of additions and subtractions, but I think this is good enough for our purposes. Um, what I'm, gonna, I'm also going to do uh, uh, something else that's a little different from the way they do it in the book. Uh, I'm going to use a kind of recursive strategy in order to calculate uh, this function, uh, big N of little n. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about uh, how does uh, big N of n plus 1 compared to big N of n, right? How much bigger is it? Well, you, here's a picture of what's going on, right? So we've got, uh, th this would be the augmented matrix that you use to solve uh, the, the equation a times x equals b, right? We've got um, n plus 1 rows on the left and n plus 1 columns. We've got the augmented column on the right, which actually has um, uh, and n plus uh, sorry yeah n plus one entries right on the right okay so he, here's one way you can think about this uh, the first series of steps in doing row reduction would be to clear out all of these uh, a is down here right the first thing you'd want to do would be to change all of those to zeros once you've done that then the lower part of the matrix is basically right given that there's all zeros over here the lower part of the matrix is basically just this. It's basically an n by n matrix on the left and an n by 1 matrix on the right. On the right. In other words, we have reduced uh, the problem now to um, uh, the next lower order, right? Uh, now we're trying to solve um, 
a system with n equations and n variables instead of n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 variables. And so uh, solving this equation um, is going to take a capital N of n steps. Having solved this, uh, this system of equations, or this matrix equation, we now have um, values for the last n var uh, variables, right, or, or for the last n positions in the, in the solution vector. We still have to f solve for the first um, entry in the solution vector. So we can do that simply by plugging in the solutions we got for x2, x3, x4, x5, all the way up to xn plus 1, and then solving this equation with the, the constant b1 on the right and the, and the coefficient a11 of x1. To do this requires let's, uh, n multiplications here, where we plug the x values in from, um, from uh, the second x value up to the n plus first x value, uh, and multiply by their coefficient, so that's n multiplications, and then we have to divide by the coefficient of the, the first x value, first x variable. So that requires a total of n plus 1 operations. So, um, as I said, we break it down into three steps. First, eliminate the a's in the, in the left column, solve the smaller problem, and then substitute to get um, to get the value, I shouldn't have said a11, I should have said x1 to get, the, to get the value of x1. I'll fix that in the notes. Okay, so on the next page, I'll actually do the, the algebra here. Um, for the first step, where we want to eliminate these, um, those a's and make them zeros, well, first of all, we have to, uh, the, the, there's n rows like this from, from uh, the second row to the n plus first row. So there's n rows we have to do. And in each row, let's see, we have to do one division to find out what the ratio between a sub i1 over a sub 1, 1 is. And then we have to multiply by all the entries in the row, in the original row, and add them to the new row. So that's going to require one multiplication, and it's also going to require, um, uh, yeah, one, sorry, one division, and also um, n plus 1 multiplications, the multiplications here uh, go from um, uh, the second a to the n plus first a, and then also the b on the right. So we have to multiply all of those times our factor m, uh, m, m sub i1 that we computed. We don't really have to multiply this again because we know what we're going to get. If we multiply our m times this, we're going to get exactly a21. So strictly speaking, it's not necessary to do that multiplication. So although I did not um, use that optimization in my code, I will assume it here. So I'm saying that we have um, n rows that we have to do. In each row, there's one division and n plus 1 multiplications. That's a total of n plus 2 operations in each row. So times n rows, that gives us a total of n squared plus 2n operations to clear out uh, these entries and make all of these numbers zeros. Okay? Then, uh, now we can uh, basically, basically uh, call the induction step. Uh, we, um, we then solve the smaller problem where we're solving for um, uh, an, an n-size problem where a is n by n and b is n by 1, and that's going to require uh, big n of little n steps. Finally, uh, having solved that problem, we make the back substitution for, for all the a's and then solve for x1 by, by dividing by uh, a11. That's going to require n plus 1 steps. So if you put everything together, uh, the total number of steps required to do, uh, to compute the, the larger problem, size n plus 1, is equal to the number of steps required for the smaller problem, size n, plus n squared plus 3n plus 1, right? If I add up the n plus 1 and the n squared plus 2n, right? So I get, adding all three of these terms up, I get this. So um, the, the n plus 1 size problem is n squared plus 3n plus 1 uh, steps harder or, or requires that many more steps than the uh, previous size problem. Okay, so having gotten the um, inductive formula, for capital N of n plus 1. I uh, just copied this from the previous page. Um, now note that this formula, well, I'm, I'm sorry, for, 
note that uh, it's easy to get the values for a big N of zero if you're not solving for anything, no variables, then no operations are required. If you're only solving for one variable and one equation, only a single operation is required, namely division, right? You just divide to get the solution. Um, now, uh, we, we will actually be able to use this inductive formula for um, uh, uh, n of n plus 1 in order to get the, the um, uh, closed formula that doesn't require uh, an inductive step. So here's how it works. Suppose I want to c calculate um, big N of little n. Well, applying the inductive formula to the case where uh, 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 when we're um, when n plus 1 corresponds to just n, then the previous case would be the case of n minus 1, right? So I replace n plus 1 by n, and I replaced n by n minus 1, and then I replaced n minus 1, uh, uh, or plugged in n minus 1 for n in this expression to get this, right? So applying the inductive formula, I get this formula for uh, big N of little n, right? Now, I can do that again. I can keep playing this game. I can uh, uh, apply the inductive formula to uh, apply the inductive formula to this term, n of n minus one, and applying the formula here. Uh, if I replace the n plus one up here by n minus one, then the formula becomes. Let's say n would get replaced by n minus two, and uh, n n squared plus three n plus one. Uh, we'd replace n again by n minus two in that. So what we've done here, <clears throat> let me try to make this a little bit clearer. I replaced this term by these two terms, and I kept this term as it was. Right? Now, you can keep doing this, right? You can keep doing this all day. Well, not all day. Actually, you can keep doing this until you get down to zero. Right? At that point, you really have to stop. So if you do that so until you get down to zero, what you're going to end up with at the end is n of zero is just zero. So this term is going to disappear at the end. And you're going to have a series of these, uh, these n squared plus 3n plus 1 terms, except where n is replaced by n minus 1 and n minus 2 and n minus 3, all the way down to zero. In other words, what you get is this summation when you add those up. Right? You can, um, the way I've written it, I, I, it's kind of backwards. I'm summing from n minus 1 down to zero, but you know it means the same thing mathematically. So we're summing up these expressions, uh, n squared plus 3n plus 1, but for all n, n values from 0 up to n minus 1. And that will give us back the value of big N of, of little n, right? The computational complexity of solving the, the n-sized problem. OK, so we break this up into three terms, right? You have a sum of, of uh, three terms. I can write it as three separate sums, or the, the, the sum of three separate summations. So the first one, the sum from 1 to n minus 1 of k squared. By the way, I dropped the case when uh, k equals 0, because if k equals 0, it doesn't, it doesn't contribute anything to the sum. Right? Similarly, I rewrote um, the sum of 3k. I pulled out the factor of 3 and wrote it as a sum from k equals 1 to n minus 1. Again, when, n, when k equals 0, it doesn't contribute anything to the sum. And then note that when you add up uh, a 1, for each of the uh, sum ends, uh, you know, as k goes from 0 to n minus 1, you're actually adding 1 to itself n times altogether. So I just added 1, uh, sorry, n here at the end. OK, so we got these three terms. We want to evaluate these. Now at this point, I'm going to remind you of some formulas you've probably seen before. I'm pretty sure you've seen this one, right? This is the formula for triangular numbers. Uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, those, those numbers like that, where you add up all the uh, integers from 1 to m. Here I'm doing it in terms of m. Um, and the formula for that is m times n plus 1 over 2. Um, this is also, by the way, it's equal to um, m uh, to, to m plus 1 choose 2. Right. Um, so it's related to the choose function. There's also a formula for, for calculating the sum of squares of, of the natural numbers. So the sum of k squared as k goes from 1 to m. It's a little more complicated, but not too bad. Uh, m times m plus 1 times 2m plus 1 uh, divided by 6. Okay. So on the next slide, I'm going to use these two formulas in order to simplify this expression that we got. Okay, and get rid of the summations. Right? Just write a nice closed formula. Okay, so let's see. I just copied the formula from the previous page. 
And if I plug in the formula for the sum of squares, I get this. Notice that I replaced m in the general formula by n minus 1, right? Because that's how many terms I'm going up to. Similarly, uh, in the summation of k, uh, I replaced m again by n minus 1 and got the 3 out front still, and I copied over the n here. Okay? So we get the sum of these three terms. You can do the algebra, uh, add everything up, uh, simplify it. One way to write it is this. Actually, probably a good idea to divide out the common factor of 2 and also pull out the factor of n. doesn't hurt. So you can write this um, as n times the quantity n squared plus 3n minus 1 all divided by 3. The most important thing to note is that this is basically a, a, a third degree uh, polynomial. It's third degree in n, and that means if you double the size of the uh, matrix, it's going to require eight times as many uh, uh, multiplications and divisions. Right? So the, um, the computational complexity uh, um, is, is third order. It's, it, more precisely, it's on the order of n cubed over 3. Okay. But you do pay a high price for increasing the size of the, of the problem. If you increase the size of the matrix, right, um, the, 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 um, uh, by a certain factor, then the, the complexity of the problem increases by the cube of that factor. Okay, now, you could do the same kind of calculation to, to calculate the, the computational complexity of finding the inverse matrix of a given matrix. Of course, that's going to be more complicated because now, in this case, when you're solving the equation ax equals b, b is not a, um, uh, um, uh, uh, an n by 1 vector, it's an n by n matrix, right? Uh, it's actually the identity matrix, so of course that's going to be more complicated. However, interestingly, it doesn't turn out to be um, a massively more complicated, it only turns out to be about three times more complicated. So if you do the do the calculation like we just did, and God knows I'm not going to do it again because it was awful, but um, if you do the calculation for, um, uh, for finding the inverse matrix, it turns out you get about n cubed, right? As compared with n cubed over 3 for doing Gaussian elimination for certain, in the case when um, uh, b is, is simply an n by 1 matrix, right, a vector. So it's not massively more complicated. However, it is three times more complicated. And what that means is that if you want, um, it's a it would be a bad idea to try to solve the equation ax equals b by using the inverse matrix, right? You might think, well, why don't we compute the, the inverse of a and then multiply on both sides by the inverse and solve for x that way. Um, it works mathematically, but it's terrible computationally because this is going to take three times as long, right? Doing this, calculating the inverse matrix, takes three times as long as simply calculating the solution for x directly, okay? So Gaussian elimination is about three times faster than using uh, the inverse matrix in order to, to solve um, systems of equations or, or, or matrix equations. Um, in fact, it, it is seldom uh, a good idea to, to calculate an inverse matrix. This may seem hard to believe because so much, well, it, it, inverse matrices are so interesting, uh, so nice to work with from a theoretical point of view, but from a uh, numerical analysis point of view, they're, they're not really good things to use because they're, they're, they're three times as expensive to uh, compute as, as other methods of solving systems of equations. Um, I usually tell my finite students that if, uh, it, it is worth calculating an inverse matrix if you'll be able to reuse it, but as you'll see, that's not, that's not exactly true. In fact, even if you, you want to um, reuse uh, the inverse, so to speak, uh, that is if you want to solve um, related systems of equations where uh, ax equals b, ax equals c, ax equals d, where the, the a is the same, um, there are better methods in computing the inverse, even in those cases. So uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but anyway, the moral is it's better to just solve directly for x using Gaussian elimination than to use any method to, uh, to compute the inverse and then use the inverse to solve the, the, the matrix equation.